stage and also on the fourth floor below, although I don't know the sequencing of where they're at with ending their panel, so um, just uh, FYI. So uh, if I could have our spotlight talk, speakers gather near the front of the stage. Mariba, you are the second up, I believe. So. Yeah. No, you're on time. That's excellent. That's, that, that's what we want. Um, so as people, uh, as people make their way into the room or into the other room, um, our first spotlight talk will be from uh, Dr. Connie Walker, who is an astronomer at, N at NSF's NOR lab. Uh, so Connie is going to talk to us about some of the interactions between the large constellations and uh, our ability to continue to conduct astronomical, astronomical observations and quiet and dark skies. And so I'm going to wait maybe a minute or two and let folks settle before we play the video. Yeah, yeah, no, no, the, the coffee break is a bit later, however. Uh, folks, if we could please take our seats, we'll have a coffee break after this next session concludes. Um, all right, well, we're going to go ahead and play the video. Uh, so our first spotlight talk will be from Dr. Connie Walker again, the NSF NOIR lab looking at dark and quiet skies and the relationship of large constellations to uh, the astronomy science uh, sector. So if we could cue the, the video from Dr. Walker, please. Welcome to the Spotlight Talk on Optical Astronomy and Very Large Satellite Constellations. My name is Connie Walker. I am a scientist at the U.S. National Science Foundation's National Optical Observatory, known as NOIR Lab, and also the co-director of the International Astronomical Union, or IAU, Center for the Protection of Dark and Quiet Sky from Satellite Constellation Interference, or IAU CPS for short. Three years ago, a train of 60 Starlink satellites visible to the unaided eye from many countries ignited global discussions of satellite constellations and their many impacts on professional astronomy, dark skies, space debris, cultural sky traditions, and escalating environmental concerns. I will be discussing how satellite constellations impact optical astronomy, and they do so in two main ways, through their numbers and their brightness. In terms of brightness, commercial communications satellites in low Earth orbit, or LEO, that weigh more than 100 kilograms typically exceed that brightness target of seventh magnitude. They are seen as orange dots in this plot. Seventh magnitude is the limit at which residual effects like crosstalk in images are difficult to remove. And it is also the limit of human vision. So the horizontal blue line refers to seventh magnitude the vertical blue line refers to 100 kilograms. And you'll note that Starlink and OneWeb satellites, as of a year ago, when this plot was made, fell in the lower right-hand quadrant, which indeed corresponds to being brighter than seventh magnitude and more massive than 100 uh, kilograms. In terms of numbers, the top curve shows the total number, almost 26,000 uh, to date of tracked objects in space from the first satellite in 1957 to March 1st of this year. This includes both active and inactive satellites that are more than 10 centimeters in size. Since the launch of the first 60 Starlink satellites, the number of LEO satellites has jumped from about 2,000 to three times as many in as many years, with more planned by numerous space actors. The term analyst objects are an additional 20,000 objects tracked by the US Space Surveillance Network, but their origins cannot be identified. Note that almost half of the satellites are Starlinks and OneWeb satellites. If all the proposed satellites are licensed and launched, this will potentially result in tens of thousands to 100,000 satellites in LEO, if not more, by 2030. Here's an update on Starlink satellites. Uh, SpaceX 
it has the largest constellation currently in orbit, 2383 that are active, and there has been a change in satellite design. Launches since September 2021 no longer have visors. They were removed for, for laser communications between the satellites. The new Starlinks, generation 1.5, are sixth magnitude in brightness, about a half a magnitude brighter than the visor sats were, and they were about 6.5 magnitudes on average. And just to note, the higher the number, the fainter the satellites. Starlink Generation 2 satellites, which will be about 30,000 uh, in addition to the 12,000 from Generation 1, are more massive, about 1.25 tons compared with 250 kilograms. And this is about four to five times more massive as Generation 1. So Generation 2 satellites will be about seven meters long. And uh, Starship, which will launch these satellites, will launch up to about 120 Gen 2 Starlinks at a time. This is twice as many per launch. And at this point, we cannot predict how bright they will be. As a reminder, satellites are visible when they are, are in sunlight or in penumbra and not in the cone of Earth's shadow. And that depends on a number of things like orbital inclination of the satellite, altitude of satellite, and the time of year as to when they're visible. The brightness of the satellite involves a multitude of considerations. Altitude, attitude, albedo, size, surface characteristics, specular diffusion reflection, uh, self-shadowing, and solar phase angle. Taking all of this into consideration, Pat Seitzer has modeled the visible, uh, visibility of these uh, satellites, and he's from the University of Michigan. Uh, shown here is a sample of 10,000 satellites at 500 kilometers, as well as 10,000 at 10,000 at kilometers altitude. And uh, they're at an inclination or latitude of 53 degrees. And we're considering right now in the plot only the ones above 30 degrees elevation. So for that many, you can see that there's not, there's just only a few above 30 degrees elevation. However, the numbers increase linearly. That is, if you have uh, 10 times more satellites, you're going to have 10 times more that are visible. And in this model, if there are, uh, if you just consider the ones, if you consider all of them above the horizon or zero degrees elevation, you're talking about uh, three times as many. The higher the um, altitude of the satellites, remember, the more visible all night long they will be, as you can see with the blue uh, curve here. How do satellites affect observations on telescopes? Uh, a bright satellite streak can saturate a detector and or cause loss of information in pixels, crosstalk in electronics, ghost images, and possible residual images. The impact on the science done with optical astronomy has two major areas of concern. One is with low elevation or twilight studies, like with the potentially hazardous asteroid missions, and they will have fewer discoveries and fewer over orbit determinations should they be affected by uh, satellite constellations. The second area is the science done at observatories with wide fields of view and sensitive detectors. These will also be very, very affected. For example, Rubin Observatory will ma be making a 10-year movie mapping the sky every three nights and hopefully discovering transient, I'm sure they'll discover lots of transient discoveries, transient um, events. However, with more and more satellite constellations, the majority of um, Rubin Observatory images will contain one or more satellites each. So to, to address the, the impact of satellite constellations on astronomy, soon after the first 60 Starlink satellites were launched in May 2019, astronomers organized two workshops in 2020 to identify the issues and formulate recommendations for mitigation. The workshop reports for satellite, uh, SATCON 1, excuse me, and Dark and Quiet Skies 1 can be found online. And then in 2021, we had the sequels to both of those workshops in which we identified pathways to imp implement the recommendations. And those reports too are online. Now, 
in 2022, we are taking those pathways to implement the recommendations by forming the IAU Center on the Protection of the Dark and Quiet Sky from Satellite Constellation Interference, or IAUCPS, and this just started two months ago. The mitigation recommendations that came out of the first workshop are being worked on by groups who are members of the IU Center or CPS. For instance, we have submitted a proposal to the US National Science Foundation to fund software to develop and, uh, pr and predict passes over observatories to avoid satellite constellations and also to program around their passes. Uh, so the University of Washington, for instance, has a data repository that is opening to store images of satellite streaks. And third, uh, we, with the assistance of the American Astronomical Society, we have continued discussions with the big satellite companies um, on many of the other items on this list and also with other think tanks and the future looks bright. We are also talking with some national governments directly and as well as through the UN COPUS, a Committee for the Peaceful Use of Outer Space meeting, and its subcommittee meetings of the Science and Technology and also the Legal Subcommittee. The IU Center is going to uh, coordinate efforts from many of its members throughout the world and endeavor to unify voices of the global astronomical community. The center will bring together uh, astronomers, industry, uh, and policy experts, as well as the wider community, and act as a bridge between all of these stakeholders. The center will produce and disseminate information and resources for everyone to be able to use. And the center will continue to research on the satellite constellation issues to arrive at feasible and implementable solutions in the areas of uh, the four hubs, which include SatHub, and that's a hub for observations. Uh, it's also a data repository of observations and uh, ha will have software that I mentioned earlier to predict passes, to mask the trails, and more. The policy hub um, will also address national and international policies fra and frameworks for regulations. The industry and technology hub will uh, work towards uh, mitigation techniques and best practices. And the communications and engagement hub, uh, communication, community engagement hub, excuse me, will um, be a voice for uh, various uh, communities uh, that uh, otherwise would not have a voice. Please feel free to, to use these emails to contact either Piero, who's the director, Federico, who's the other co-director, or myself. And we very much uh, would appreciate hearing from you. And if you'd like to become a member, again, that's uh, cps.iu.org, where you can find the membership form. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Walker, and uh, we appreciate you, you recording that for us uh, in advance since um, unable to, to join in person. Uh, next, I would like to welcome Mariba Ja, uh, who is the chief scientist and co-founder of Privateer, a data, intelligence, a data and intelligence platform to empower the future of space sustainability. I think, Mariba, I think you're going to talk to us a little bit about the role of data and knowing what we know about space objects to enable an in, in-space economy, correct? That was terrible. I, I apologize for that. You'll do a far better job than me. Let me get off the stage. <laughs> the stage is yours. Hello, hello. All right. Um, Thank you all very much. I'm so pleased to be here. The first thing I'm going to ask people is the folks that are having conversations in the background, if you want to chat, you can leave the room now. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you to actually sit down and either listen to me or leave. I'm serious. You can have your conversations, but you can have them elsewhere. Because the thing is, I have some stuff to say, and if you don't want to hear it, that's fine. You can find yourself someplace else. Bring up my website, please. Now would be a great time. OK. So with all, all technology, as we know, all technology works. This is actually supposed to be showing you something, but clearly it's a blank screen, so I've clearly I've kicked it off with nothingness for you, <laughs> which I'm very pleased with. We'll see if eventually something happens here. All right, so I only have like eight to 10 minutes. Here's what I want to tell you folks, right? Um, for one, clearly we understand that space is a very dynamic environment. We're launching more and more things into space. In 1957, we started with one satellite called Sputnik. Um, 
What could go wrong with the whole picture of launching things in space? Well, now we're tracking about 50,000 things ranging in size from your cell phone all the way to the space station. Um, it's a finite resource. We don't put things randomly in outer space. We put things in very specific places. I'm going to call them orbital highways. These orbital highways are becoming more and more congested. The people that are launching stuff into space are doing so without coordinating and planning with other countries and other people in terms of launching these things. Um, anybody, show of hands, if you've heard of something called Tragedy of the Commons? All right. So here's the thing. Um, for those that have not heard of such a thing, when you have a finite resource, let's call it plot of land, uh, let's say that uh, we have a nice place for cattle to graze, and each of us has some cattle, we bring more and more cattle to the land, and we don't talk to each other and don't manage that jointly, eventually the cattle die because they eat all this stuff, and they can't basically produce anymore, and the carrying capacity of that land is saturated, okay? So very similarly to that, you know, when we have these orbital highways, we have this carrying capacity that can become saturated. And what does saturation mean in orbital highways? What it means is that our ability to prevent undesirable things from happening, things bumping into each other and that sort of stuff, we can't prevent that anymore. Like, as much as we try to decide and act for people to be safe in space, bad things are happening, for all intents and purposes, that orbital highway becomes useless. And so the thing that we need to understand is that near-Earth space is a finite resource. Um, the carrying capacity can become saturated in these orbits. We have to find a way to communicate with each other and jointly manage and utilize the resource. And interestingly enough, you know, Connie talked about you know, the impacts to astronomy and trying to understand and predict light pollution to astronomers. One of the things that I'll say is that the space sustainability rating that uh, we talked about earlier in the whole detection, identification, and tracking incorporates a lot of the, the data and the understanding of how to predict these things. So part, part, of, part of the SSR will address uh, ground-based astronomy. It's not just for space operators and that sort of thing. So good things are happening when it comes to the SSR. When it comes to data, people, how many people believe data and information is the same stuff? That was a trick question. Of course, everybody's like not raising their hand because like embarrassed. I don't want to be the dummy that, okay. So here's the thing, right? So data exists everywhere. Information only exists when you ask a question to data. That's the way it works. Now, what's the data problem when it comes to space? Everybody has different eyes and ears about what's happening in space. And one of the things that I tell my students is, if you want to know something, you have to measure it. If you want to understand something, you have to predict it. Prediction is the key. Anybody can tell you what happened in the past. That's easy. Tell me what's going to happen tomorrow, then I'll be impressed. And so the thing is, in general, and I'm going to get a bit philosophical here. I don't care. Just bear with me because you gave me eight to ten minutes, so I'm going to use it the way I want to use it. So here it goes. So there's all this stuff happening in space. How do we know? We have to measure this stuff. Okay? Things are happening. We measure it. The observations generate data. The data tend to have structure and follow distribution. There's a pattern. There's an emergent pattern in the data. From that emergent pattern in the data, we can infer a model. We can hypothesize something. We can say, this is what, what we believe explains the evidence. That belief helps us predict what's going to happen. The difference between what we observe next and our predictions constitutes surprisal. If we can predict the truth exactly, there's no surprise. We live in a boring universe. We're yawning our way through life. I'm not in that position. If anybody here is, let, let me talk to you because I want to make some money. So the thing is, surprise is an ability to learn. It tells you there's something that you have not understood. Okay? Very good. Now. Once you can learn something, you can start refining your ability to predict, and this is where we need to get to, because in order for space to be safer, more secure, more sustainable, we need to be able to make it more transparent, meaning what's up there, who does it belong to, what is it doing? We need to make it more predictable. What's gonna happen in the future? And given any two space actors, Chinese satellite, US satellite, here's some conjunction, what are they going to do? So it's more than just physics. It's anthropological. It's social, scientific. 
And then we need to develop a body of evidence to hold people accountable for their behaviors in space. So this whole cycle of some stuff is happening, observations, hypothesis, prediction, surprise, that's the process that we're into. And one of the things that we're trying to do with Privateer is we're trying to say, look, people have different beliefs and opinions about stuff in space, but if you can look at the news, you can see somebody says, oh, there's going to be a collision tomorrow. The, same per the other person says, well, based on my evidence, not so much. When we have different pockets of evidence, we're going to come up with different conclusions. They can't possibly be the same. This does not work for space. If the US has some belief, China has some belief, Russia has another belief, and we're all you know, behaving based on our own evidence, but we don't share the evidence to have a common pool of evidence from which to infer, this can't work out well. One of the things that we're trying to do at Privateer is we're trying to work with the global community and say, here's a platform where we're trying to crowdsource and bring in multiple sources of information and statistically understand the nuances of this so that we can have a common pool of evidence from which to draw conclusions so that we can make informed decisions of what to do in space. Space is not really different from the land, air, and the oceans. The way we've been behaving, the way we explore land, air, and oceans has been to the detriment of the environment. We have marine debris, we have ocean plastics, all these sorts of things. We're seeing stuff like that in space. And part of it is because people don't understand that all things are interconnected and that stewardship is what we need to embrace to solve the problem. So anyway, with that, I'm going to get off the stage. I'm going to say thank you very much for listening to me. And let's bring up the next person. Thank you, Mariba. I, I appreciate the, the wider perspective, right? The, the information we can take from our data, if I've got that right, I hope. Um, but there's the, the behavioral and the contextual aspects of that are something we always need to think about. So thank you. So we're going to stay on the theme of space situational awareness and strategies thereof. Uh, I want to introduce Dr. Marie LaPelk. Did I get that right? All right, good. Um, from the Australian Space Agency, who's going to tell us uh, you are the space situational awareness lead, I believe, and space sustainability lead uh, for the Australian Space Agency, and you're going to talk about some of your agency's viewpoints on these topics. So, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yes, I'm going to try and talk about Australia and space sustainability, but I'm just wondering if everyone knows what Australia is actually doing in space. So maybe I will start there, a bit of background. Um, the Australian Space Agency is quite young, but in terms of Australia's story with space, it goes back to the 50s. Um, it's about the rockets, tracking stations, uh, helping with uh, Apollo program. Um, so we have been active in space, and it's, just not, it's not just about size or number of satellites. We have a bit less than 30 uh, satellites up there at the moment. It's really about this whole journey that we're on. So if I go back to the, the, the agency. So the agency was established in 2018. Um, at that time, it's interesting to look at the strategy that we uh, put together and the charter that we also established at the same time. If you look at the strategy, uh, responsible is one of the four pillars of the strategy. It's also in our vision, and it's also the first value of our charter. So really, we need uh, to deliver on safe and sustainable uh, space activities. The question is how? I'm going to try and show you three examples of what we do in the space sustainability um, aspect. Um, we are working on a space sustainability framework. Uh, the, the, the goal of this framework is to do sustainability as part of everything we do, not as something we would try to do on the side when we have time, but to embed it in everything so that it, it is less effort, less money as well, because we're young, uh, young country in space, uh, and we we can't afford to just 
do a massive sustainability um, plan, but we want to do sustainability everywhere. So the roadmap is the first example. Um, we have roadmaps for seven civil, civil space priority areas. Um, we develop these roadmaps as setting the scene and providing a vision of what could be the industry growth for the next 10 years. It's basically giving opportunities for technology development, for investment, um, trying to help the industry. Um, you can see on the screen that there are three roadmaps that are out, and the one that is blurred is actually the roadmap I'm, I'm leading, uh, Space Institutional Awareness and uh, Debris Mitigation. It will be published soon. Um, I will try and talk to you about what we do in that space as an example of how we use and uh, we look at sustainability there. So as I said, sustainability is embedded in everything we do. In the roadmap, it's considered as a key enabler, a key facilitator of what we do in each priority area. And for SSA, I think you understood it now after these two days, we know that we need to do something about space debris because it's about what we could do in space in the future. If we don't do something about space debris now, there is no future of space activities. So yes, we have to do something. Um, but the way we looked at it in the roadmap is also saying, well, sustainability now is looked at um, and we need to do something. So there may, might be an opportunity, a market opportunity for us in that space. Um, and we look at two buckets. The first one is we need to stop creating more debris. So we need responsible missions, responsible systems. Um, and we can actually create technologies that will support that to um, be better at tracking, maneuver, uh, even the end of life of missions. So. Everything that Australian industry can do in that space, it's a market opportunity for them. Um, so we're trying to look at these advantages and try to make it an opportunity. The other bucket is, well, we know that there are space debris, we need, we need SSA, we need STM. So what are the technologies that we have in Australia to share with the world and have, again, a market opportunity there? Um, so obviously we have advantages, they are technical, but also, well, you all know that Australia has a quite unique view of the sky and yeah, it's down under. So we look at all that and, and that's part of the, the sustainability aspect. It's what we do for every, S, every SPA, so priority area. Um, we also provide funding um, for SSA. I will give you three examples that are related to, to um, the funding that we, we provided. Silentium, a passive radar that we're supporting, um, Industrial Science Group, and uh, it's a tool to um, predict and have solutions for collision avo avoidance, and then Sabre, a mission control center that includes SSA capabilities. It goes beyond SSA, I said it before, and it goes beyond the agency as well. There are other initiatives that are uh, done in Australia, and I just wanted to give you three of them. EOS, uh, with a, a research project looking at uh, changing the orbit of a debris with a la laser so that it can avoid a collision. Another one that we've been uh, looking at with the SPIRIT mission is simply to test the uh, SSR that we've been talking about. What we wanted was really to understand how it works, does it work for our industry, does it work for a CubeSat, a university project, um, and just to test it so we can see if it is measur measurable, if we could work with it uh, with our licensing process, everything that we can explore to have tangible results and measurable results. And the last one that I wanted to mention, Newman Space, um, they, are looking, they are working on a project for a propulsion system um, that uh, is able to use recycled metal in space. So again, sustainability is large. Um, it's not just about space debris in my view, it's everything that um, we look at from all our priority areas, dark sky, spectrum interference, um, everything. And that's what we're trying to uh, look at with this sustainability framework um, that we're developing. Another um, important aspect of the framework is recognizing that technology is not the only thing. We talked about it earlier. 
It's also about regulation, coordination, uh, international collaboration. So we know that we can't do it um, on our own, and I think Moriba said it quite uh, clearly again. Um, so we participate in international um, discussions, and Australia was one of the funding members of COPIUS, and we continue to participate in these discussions. We are committed to implement the LTS guidelines. Uh, we participate in different uh, working groups to try and identify uh, recommendations, solutions for space sustainability. Um, but we do know that this takes time. It has to happen, but we also need to do our part on our side with national activities that will move quicker and with quicker solutions. Um, so at national level, we, we did review our Space Act, and now there is a, a requirement in the Act uh, for a space debris uh, mitigation uh, plan, and it has to be based on international standards. So that's the kind of thing that links to the LTS guidelines and the implementation of the guidelines. Um, and we are going further with more uh, uh, regulatory refinement. Um, I didn't have the minister to say it out loud, but uh, yeah, we are working on that as well. Um, and the last one that I wanted to mention when we talk about space and sustainability, um, in my view, sustainability is not just environment, it's social, environment, and economics. And I want to talk about the social side a bit more because we talk about space heritage. For Australia, this space heritage and heritage is actually important because we have something special that is our Aboriginal background. Um, we do recognize that the First Nations people are, they were the, actually the, the first, the oldest uh, astronomers, and that's why our logo at the Australian Space Agency uh, is a tribute to what they've done uh, with the constellation, Aboriginal constellation. But a tribute is not enough. Uh, we want to use their expertise. We have a program to use their, their expertise um, inside the agency and more globally so that we learn from what they, do, they know about astronomy. But they were actually also very good at sustainability. So we want to use this expertise. Um, again, that was really just a glimpse of what we do at the Australian Space Agency and in Australia in general. Um, I came all the way here um, with a non that sustainable travel uh, to meet with you. So please come and talk to me. Uh, try and, and, and identify things that we can do together, um, opportunities for collaboration uh, with the Australian Space Agency, but also I'm happy to facilitate um, discussions with our industry. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Uh, quite a holistic viewpoint of the way to, to integrate sustainability into strategy, policy, and I guess culture um, as much as anything. So thank you for that. Uh, our next talk will be from Frédéric Brunel of the European Space Agency. He's a project manager uh, there, and he's going to talk about the European Space Agency's perspective on space sustainability. The floor is yours. Manage. Great. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm coming not so far from you. I'm just from Oxford, so it's almost sustainable transport. Um, yeah, it's really a pleasure to be here today. I have a good news. I have only one slide. The bad news is that I have few paper with me, and you will have to support my pitch. <laughs> So I think we all agree after these two days that, and at least it's a vision shared by several agencies, including ESA, that space is fundamental to building a sustainable future. This is, I would say, is a key statement for today, and I will repeat several times. For ESA, for the European Space Agency, sustainability means acting on two aspects. Sustainability from space, that you have on the left side, and sustainability of space. And this really, let's say, the two elements, the two challenges for the European Space Agency, and we consider it the same side, the two sides, let's say, of the same coin. Let's start by sustainability from space. There is a lot of initiative, and I'm sure that you share with my colleagues in the last two days coming from ESA, they present you different initiatives we had in the European Space Agency. And this is supported through different directorates. Today, I'm representing the Directorate of Telecommunication and Integrated Application. I will focus so on three of them. There is a lot, but maybe we will discover a little bit what we are doing in telecommunication to support sustainability. 
We have one initiative, which is a green accelerator, one which is a digital twin earth, and the last one, digitalization. Few words, very fast, on the green accelerator. The European Space Agency have a space for a green future accelerator, and this is a major ESA initiative, aiming to accelerate the use of space, helping Europe, and I'm sure it was repeated by a lot of you and a lot of colleagues from ESA, to be the first carbon neutral continent by 2050. Our director general, by the way, put the goal a little bit higher because he have announcing 2030, so we are ready to work hard to make it happen. On the digital twin hearse, a second initiative, this will provide, let's say, um, a very dynamic and interactive representation of the Earth system processes. And this mainly based on clouds. This is why I really appreciate what you say on the data. It's something very often we forgot. And the high performance uh, computing and also the artificial intelligence. And we will use this for predictive analysis. It's quite obvious. Based on our data collected, so through ESA, our the fleet, but also the European Commission, and all our partners, because we share the data of our planet. Last and not least, digitalization. I'm sure you are certainly familiar with smart cities, smart grids, smart connectivity, smart mobility concepts. By driving the digitalization, we are unlocking new application and new way uh, to better manage the planet resources. Basically, we are moving from the data to the information and from the knowledge to the action. And this is one of the key uh, challenge for the agency. Here's the telecommunication and integrated application directorate, so the directorate from where I'm, I'm working for. Um, it's based in Arwell, in Exat, so we are UK flag. <laughs> and we have to mission to develop and to integrate the space solution in our systems. Systems means the ground one, the space one, and the hand-to-hand -hand system. For this, we need to develop a better connectivity, better security, better sustainability. And this is why we have this three pillar, space to connect, space uh, to secure, and space to sustain. A concrete example, let's be concrete after this uh, <laughs> very diplomatic introduction. Uh, a concrete example how the directorate is contributing to the green accelerator I was earlier talking about a few seconds ago. We are working with the industry of the automotive, sorry, automotive industry in order to deliver a seamless um, satellite terrestrial connectivity. And in fact, by boosting the vehicle connectivity, the connected car will be able to optimize not only the safety, is something that we hear several times today, but also its operation and its energy efficiency. So basically, by boosting the vehicle connectivity, we will be able to optimize traffic flow, to reduce the fuel consumption, and of course, at the end, to optimize and reduce the CO2 emission, which is also one of our challenge. To make a transition with the second element, so the sustainability of space, I should say that we cannot only protect and manage our resources on Earth, and we cannot, sorry, we cannot do it without protecting and managing our asset in Europe, our space assets. And this is the second challenge, this is the second, let's say, element of our strategy. I said a moment ago, but I will say it again, space is fundamental to be a sustainable um, future for Europe and for the world. And this is why to protect and manage our access to space is fundamental. To illustrate the second element, I will very fast talk about the space debris removal. You heard a lot about it and space traffic management, which are two important aspects of this challenge, sustainability of space. Regarding the space debris removal, I will not enter. You had fantastic presentation, technical, commercial, etc. I will just say that at ESA, we have created an accelerator, protection of space assets, and this will unite all European industry participants to the end dependence on non-European source of space hazard debris, but also data and debris mitigation services. So it's a concrete example of what the European Space Agency in support with the member state and the industry operator is proposing for the space debris removal. Regarding the space traffic management, it's also an excellent topic, I think, for the sustainable, sustainable uh, economy. A decade ago, less than a decade ago, ESA, so the European Space Agency, and EXAT, so the entity and telecommunication team, decided to support IMARSAT, so the UK operator, to improve the air traffic management basically by bringing connectivity to plane. Last week, I don't know if you noticed, but EasyJet has announced to be the first airliner partner 
to use uh, this system, with, which we named, sorry, IRIS. What we did basically for the air must be done for space. And this is what we have to do now. And maybe in the last decade, we have just eight years to make it happen. <laughs> Indeed, the number of satellites and large constellations, and you see it today in space, keeps rising. We need a common rules on use, and we had fantastic presentation on the regulation and, and law of space. But we need also smart industries and operators proposing innovative solutions. And I think this morning you had excellent example. One example I can give you to illustrate this topic is the program Sunrise. Through the Sunrise program, which is a telecommunication partnership project, a satellite constellation operator OneWeb, I'm sure you know, is committed to responsible space. OneWeb spacecraft are designed with passivation capabilities. They orbit reliabilities, crabbling feature for active debris removal and deorbiting. So basically, OneWeb, in collaboration with AstroScale, by the way, developed and demonstrate technology required for debris removal services. If I take one second for, for this example, is I would like to illustrate that the sustainability challenge is not solved only by optimization of the operation, which are more and more complex, we can agree on this topic, or by improvement of the ground asset, but also by acting on the space asset at design level in the early stage of the project. And this is what the agency tried to, to support. We are here an enabler. The industry is bringing the answer. In conclusion, I have to say that we should not be afraid by the challenges I have presented today and you heard the last two days. We have tools. We will continue to innovate and to invent them, maintaining our position of global leader. Here, our position is not the one of the agency only. It's the industry, it's the operator, it's the society. In particular, by supporting the innovative industry operators for business that are commercially sustainable, I join your point, and socially responsible. So let me finish by how I start my speech. Space is fundamental to building a sustainable future. Thank you for your attention. So sustainability from space and sustainability of space and the interconnectedness uh, between them. Thank you. Uh, so our final uh, spotlight speaker in this session uh, is uh, Mr. Jeremy Jampoli, all right, uh, who is a lead space systems engineer for Northrop Grumman uh, based here in London and with responsibility for the UK, Europe, and MENA region. And uh, Jeremy is going to talk to us a little bit about in-space servicing and the space logistics activities. So thank you, Jeremy. Unfortunately, I don't still have that mustache. I know you all wished that I did. Um, my facial hair kind of goes in cycles, so you'll see me again and I'll probably look different. Um, also, something else that wild happened a few minutes ago was Mariba got a predominantly British audience to have audience participation at a conference, which I've never seen before. So that was fantastic. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk a little bit about Nothing, apparently. Yeah, I can chat without them. Um, Space Logistics, which is a Northrop Grumman company. Um, oh, great, well, something's happened. Um, is this working now? Oh, epic. Great, Space Logistics is a Northrop Grumman company. Um, Rob Halge is our president, unfortunately, unforeseen circumstances, he can't be here today. Uh, but you have me, so I'm kind of the lead systems engineer based in London. The accent may lead you astray, uh, but I've been here. Um, so starting, I mean, thinking about 60 years ago when the space industry started, this is Early Bird, which is Intelsat's first satellite. It launched June 28th, which is my birthday, so I accept presents as well, if you'd like. Um, thanks. Um, it was 1965, which I'm not 60 years old, so not really my birthday. Um, but kind of just the point of it, we've been doing this the same way for 60 years, right? You build something on the ground, you fold it up really nice. I used to work on the James Webb Space Telescope, which is like the most epic piece of origami you've ever seen to fit it into a five meter fairing. Um, and then you launch it, you operate it until it dies, you run out of fuel, and then you discard it. You know, either geo, you sink it to the graveyard orbit or you deorbit it. Um, and that's kind of been the same way for the last 60 years, right? The, Yes, there's been new technology, there's been higher capacity, different uses, but it's been overall the same. And of course, not sustainable. I mean, 
Everyone here at the conference, you've seen it over and over, the number of space debris there are. I mean, it just ends up, you have a world that has all this stuff around it, you know, whether it's defunct or operational, but it's not sustainable. Um, and that's, I mean, 10 to 20 satellites are, are put into graveyard orbit every year. I mean, it, it's just not going well. So what if we used kind of that reduce, reuse, recycle mentality that we have on Earth with, you know, plastic bottles and cans, but you did it in space? So if you've heard, well, I'm going to try this audience participation thing. Has anyone heard of the mission extension vehicle? Raise your hand. Whoa, we got one. Um, yeah, so about two, two years ago, 2019 and 2020, um, Space Logistics launched Mission Extension Vehicle 1 and 2, um, which is kind of the rendering is on this left side, and the right are pictures that it actually took in space of Intelsat 901 and 1002, respectively, um, where it actually went up. They weren't designed to be docked to. It came, it got into the liquid apogee engine, docked, and now they're providing station keeping. And um, from what Intelsat has told us, it didn't actually affect any of their uh, client uh, kind of performance throughout that whole process, which is pretty wild, something that wasn't designed to be docked to. We did it in space. Um, and that's, I think, kind of the first step towards sustainability and in-orbit servicing. And there's kind of three aspects to that, right? There's, there's a business case, right? So I know there's satellite operators in the room. It's not just a, a cool ESG thing that we can check off the box and say, yes, we're being sustainable. But it's actually helping your revenues. I mean, you're able to put your NRE and, and the cost of developing a new satellite, you can push that farther out and instead do on-orbit servicing to maintain the life if you, the technology and the electronics are still working. Um, usually it's the, the lack of fuel that um, ends, the, ends the satellite life early. Um, then the other aspects of sustainability, obviously, if you're doing in-orbit servicing, there's less manufacturing and precious metals and, and all that that's going in on Earth as you're building it, and then equally, it's creating less space junk. So. Um, one, continuing to have enough fuel to move it into graveyard orbit or to responsibly deorbit it at the end of life if needed, and two, you're just not sending up as much. Um, another couple really cool images. So on the, on the top left is the MRV, so the Mission Robotic Vehicle. So that's kind of the follow-on for us for the Mission Extension Vehicle. Um, it adds in a lot of robotic capabilities and an epic suite of sensors on there. Um, it's going to be able to implant Mission Extension pods onto existing satellites. So um, in 2024, we're, we're expected to launch this with a few Mission Extension pods and already have some customers, which is pretty, again, kind of mating with satellites that were not designed to be mated with and providing that kind of sustainable life extension and, and orbit station keeping. Um, down in this bottom left, you see Orbit Fab. I know my colleagues are here today from, from Orbit Fab. Um, really key that there's, this is kind of an open uh, industry, kind of in orbit servicing. It's not something to be monopolized and it's not something to be really like held, held tight to the chest, but instead we really do need to collaborate on what those kind of standards for refueling and power and grappling are. And I know, um, the Genset Orbit 5, they actually have a hardware model of their Rafty kind of refueling um, port. So it's always fun for me when you actually get your hands on the hardware. You're like, oh, this is real. We build things for space and then they go a million miles away and you never see them again. So it feels lame because you don't get to like touch like the car you're building or something. So it's always fun to see hardware. Um, but again, yeah, stressing like it's so important for cross industry and governments to be collaborating on what these standards are. Um, you know, organizations like ISO and AIAA, um, CONFERS, that was talked about. I also don't know how to pronounce it, CONFERS, CONFERS, I don't know, it never gets figured out. Um, and then the UN committees as well. So really cool that that's already happening, but again, I think from industry, we have some sort of responsibility to just really start um, getting this in motion and bringing things up and, and building the hardware and seeing if we can get agreement on those kind of things. Um, yeah, the top right is, is NASA's OSAM, so also on-orbit servicing and manufacturing. Um, cool to see that there's international governments being involved. So NASA, um, obviously, there's interest from JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, the UAE, um, e ESA, of course. Um, yeah. And the last, um, kind of, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention kind of the resilience aspect. Um, we've talked a bit about just space debris in general, of course, um, that Russia ASAT test that we all know happened. Uh, was a horrible thing, but just kind of understanding that space is becoming a contested domain, and whether that's direct if you're, you know, working with government organizations or indirect just by space debris that could be caused by those things, 
It's important to kind of build resiliency around the high, high value assets that we all have in space. Um, so on orbit servicing, again, can kind of provide that ability to either whether that's a delta V or just extending the fuel to be able to maneuver around these space debris. Um, I think especially as satellite operators, there's kind of a regret to maneuver because your fuel is really what's limiting your lifetime. And so there's always this trade-off, right, of, okay, yes, I need to save my satellite. You know, if the data is telling me, yes, there's going to be a conjunction, but we're not sure how close, there's almost this cost-benefit analysis of, do I use the fuel to try to avoid this? So on-orbit servicing is key to being able to enable um, kind of that resiliency and, and the ability to avoid the conjunctions, and especially as it becomes even a more and more kind of scary place to be, especially Leo, Bell, as we see all the mega constellations uh, coming up. So again, if we could bring that kind of reduce, reuse, recycle mentality to space, and if that becomes more of a, a reuse and repairing and recycling through on-orbit refueling, through ports that are maybe data and power um, enabled such that you can plug and play payloads and you can continue to manufacture things and assemble things on space, that's just an amazing budding industry. And it, again, it's happening now. There's two, the MEVs are both on-orbit and functioning, so it's not necessarily uh, 20 years in the future, but it is happening right now. So if we continue to do that, we'll make space safer, more sustainable for all of us to kind of expand that space economy. Thanks, and looking forward to chatting with you all later.